So uh, this is actually my second talk here in Aula Maximum, Aula Maximus. I was here last Thursday as well. I've been here for an entire week here in Croatia. I've had a chance to see a little bit of the startup scene in Osijek, in Rijeka, Zagreb, and also Zadar. So I've seen uh, a, bit of, a bit of Croatia. Uh, also visited Dreamots, a uh, very, very impressive company. So what I've been asked to talk about today is incentives. How to incentivize founders and employees. What is different about incentivizing founders and employees at tech startups in Silicon Valley for, uh, versus Europe? And what can European startups learn about in incentives and how to structure incentives so you can go, go global and grow more quickly? Um, so a little bit about me, uh, but before, first of all, let me just give you some, some key takeaways. Uh, the reason incentives are really important is because if you don't think about incentives, incentives for your founders and employees at the very beginning of the company, you, if you're planning on going global, you're very quickly going to come up, bump up against the incentive structure uh, here locally, which will not be appropriate for moving into the United States and other countries. So if you're especially planning to enter the US marketplace, it's really important to think very early on on your incentive structures and make sure that those are aligned and uh, synced up with how incentives are organized in the United States. Um, let's see. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I lecture on European entrepreneurship at Stanford going on seven years now. I'm based in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, in the design group. A lot of what I've been talking about here in Croatia this past week is the importance of product design for building great companies, for reducing failure rates, and the importance of bringing product design teaching and research programs into Croatia's engineering schools and business schools. And specifically, the use of design thinking and lean launchpad techniques of prototyping, rapid prototyping, iterative prototyping of new products but also direct end user engagement uh, at a very high level, very intense, deep level. So uh, in 2014, these were uh, the speakers we brought in. We brought in our first startup from Croatia, Matija Kopic of Farmrun. We also brought in our first Bulgarian startup, Vasa Terziev out of Sofia. We've been focusing a lot on startups out of Central and Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe in recent years, but we try and cover as much of uh, other parts of Europe as well. I also invite you to follow us uh, at our Twitter handle at Europreneurs and on our website at www.stanfordeuropreneurs.org. So uh, our session, our first creation speaker was Mancia Kopic, Farmron, very, very impressive enterprise software company focused on dairy herd farm management, as you all know. Jeff Lynn of Cedars, uh, Europe's leading equity crowdfunding startup out of London. And then our first Bulgarian entrepreneur and Slovenian designer, Japic Kopic, out of uh, Seaway Design in, uh, in Ljubljana. Um, so weekend before last, I spent in Osijek mentoring startups, Croatian, other Southeastern European startups. And I wanted to share with you some of the impressions I and some of the other founders, uh, other mentors came away with from those three days. Um, these were some of the key issues that many of the startup teams missed over and over again, which, which I think has in part its roots in the uh, not enough thinking going into incentives for founders and, and the rest of the team. Poor team cohesion, confusion over who's a co-founder, founder versus employee, uh, one founder, many employees, uneven engagement, passion, uh, energy across team members, uh, some teams, there was a very dominant team member. Everyone else was hanging back, waiting for the team member to finish talking. Uh, major disconnects between the technical team here, which often is the founding team, and then the sales and marketing team over here, which came in later. Uh, that's also uh, something you can address with incentives. Uh, employees, people down, who were considered down here versus critical members of the team, a sense early on that a lot of, a lot of the other team members really were second, third level, really were not part of the, the core team. And insufficient recognition, uh, in, inadequate titles that don't really recognize and reflect the role and level of responsibility and contributions of, of the team members. For example, uh, a lot of people named project assistant, for example, versus vice president of sales or chief marketing officer. So those were some of the observations we saw very frequently weekend before last in Osijek. Uh, 
We don't want to see one-man shows as startups, as investors, as coaches, mentors. Uh, they're not scalable in terms of the company culture, in terms of your ability to move fast. And so, you know, are, are you a one-man startup or a solid team that can work under stress, pivot, and grow is the key question. Um, so again, coming back to some of the th ways and, and mindsets we bring to thinking about incentives. Uh, incentives are critical to the future growth of the company if you're planning on going global, if you're planning on working outside of Europe and especially out of this part of Europe. It's, it's essential to align the startup incentives for both founders and employees with the growth goals of the company, with the business goals. Incentives, and I'll talk specifically about two types of incentives, stock options and company culture. Uh, incentives are very, very important to attract and retain new employees, especially as you get into much more competitive, fast-moving markets, especially in the United States, where there's a huge demand and competition for employees. Incentives are important to building strong and cohesive teams. Uh, they're very important to align and support the creation of a positive company culture that attracts and keeps people. Incentives are vital to empowering employees. It's very important that all employees should feel empowered and engaged. And also incentives, particularly stock option incentives, are very, very important to building the local startup and investor ecosystem culture and knowledge base. So these are, I apologize for the, for the table, I won't run through, through all of these with you, but these are some of the differences in environment between Silicon Valley and Europe, which means, uh, which explains some of the differences in how European founders and startups and investors approach incentives versus Silicon Valley uh, founders and investors. In the Valley, we have very fast moving markets, rapid growth, rapid failure, strong competition for talent, high mobility of talent, uh, engineers, salespeople leaving companies, going to other companies, starting their own companies. A very strong work-focused culture, six, seven days a week, working very, very long hours. And a very, a very strong legal system supporting stock options aimed at both startups and established corporations with a legal regime, uh, tax policies, and culture around stock options and support system around stock options. Uh, higher startup valuations, so stock is actually worth something and frequent company exits, so that stock you receive actually has a realistic chance of, of turning into real money down the road. In contrast, Europe, we see slower markets and decision making, less competition for talent, less mobility of people between companies. Uh, many, many employees prefer a very safe, secure job with a salary and benefits. Working is limited to five days a week, uh, the typical eight, nine to five or six p.m. Stock options are often viewed as suspicious, with suspicion in Europe because they're viewed by many employees as, as an attempt by the founders to cheat the employees of salary because the stock options are viewed as worthless paper in many countries. And there's a very poor or no legal regime in many European countries for handling stock options uh, at the very early stage of a company when they go from being worth very, very little because the company's little to being worth a, a lot. And of course, the lower startup valuations and the slow exits market in Europe means that stock options typically in many European startups simply don't have the potential of being worth a lot of money that they do in the United States. Um, so because of those different environments, in often in many European countries, there's a fundamental uh, difference in how incentives for founders and employees are looked at. Uh, because Europe tends to be a much slower, less competitive environment for talent, uh, fewer companies being sold. Typical incentives in Europe for employees and founders, uh, especially for employees, would be around salary, title, promotion, some perks and benefits. In the US, in Silicon Valley, New York, Boston, we use a much wider range of incentives, which include uh, stock options, of course, we'll go into some details in a minute, company culture, the proper culture is a very important way of attracting and keeping employees uh, and, and getting people to work with you, P particularly if you're looking at attracting, uh, broadening your initial team from technical founders into much more creative people, design people, sales and marketing people. You need to think very carefully about what that culture is going to look like uh, when you're at 50, 100 people. Title and recognition, of course, promotion and challenges, salary, perks, and benefits. But the key, the key differences are stock options and company culture in terms of the, the major incentives you need to think about here if you're going to be going global. 
Uh, let's talk specifically about stock options and, and what it looks like in the United States to offer employees stock options uh, for startups. So this is the typical framework uh, that founders and early employees face. This is typically how stock options are structured, is that at the very early phase of starting the company, you have a very high risk. So this is the founding phase. When you get to exit, you're at much lower risk. And then you have numbers of shares. So that the founders who are taking the largest risk get the largest number of shares. And as the risk drops, as the company uh, becomes more solid, gains more traction in the marketplace, the number of shares drops. As the company grows in valuation, the option prices go from very, very little to potentially quite a lot. So the question is, where do, you, where do you fit as a founder or employee? Typically, founders are here. The early 5, 10, 20, 100 employees are going to be on this part of the curve. When you start getting over 100, again, depending upon the sector and type of company you're in, consumer versus enterprise, then you rapidly get into this part of the stock options program where the amount of stock options granted are far fewer per employee and the strike price is much, much higher. So this is the general framework and model along which stock options are, mod are uh, organized today in the US. Let me give you some concrete examples as to stock options and how they're organized between founders uh, and employees, just with a hypothetical example. So initially, and these slides are from Wilson Sonsini Goodrich, uh, which is a very well-regarded law firm, one of the leading law firms in the Valley. But you can get any law firm in the Valley that works with startups to help you organize your stock options program. Uh, all, such law firms also exist in Boston, New York, and other major tech centers in the US. So typically, if you had three founders, it, they might be split with share, shareholdings one-third, one-third, one-third between the different founders. Then, as you move to uh, essentially the, the next phase of bringing in management, senior management, a CEO, for example, if it's not one of the founders, you're expanding this, the, the stock option, the stock pool. You have the three founders here, the CEO here, with a certain allocation, maybe 20%. Very early on, you're establishing a stock option plan where you've reserved a large block of shares for future employees. You don't know who those people are yet, but you're reserving that block of stock very, very early on and you're assigning a, a potential valuation to it. Now, the employees who get stock options can be senior managers, they can be the CEO of we seen. Uh, these are some examples of the potential uh, ranges of share ownership, uh, CFO, chief financial officer, vice presidents, director level. Others can include uh, sales and marketing people, engineering developers, designers, office managers. But this is one example of the relative range of stock options based on percentage equity of the company that they're holding uh, as, as it's distributed between some of the major employee categories and with the number of, of employees. So you can see this would be percent of capital per person and then the total equity allocated to that category of employee uh, as, as a group. Again, a hypothetical example just to give you an illustration of the, of the relative magnitude of numbers. So when you get all the way out to the initial public offering, what does it look like? What does the company stock structure look like at that point? Well, you, you've brought in a Series A, potentially, from a, from a VC who holds a major chunk, perhaps in this case, 25% of the shares of the company, a Series B uh, holder as well, uh, venture investor, you have the initial founder shares here, founder ABC here. You have the president, uh, for example, here. And here is the stock options pool, which has reduced as a total number of shares of the company, but, uh, but which has increased its stock pool. And here you have the, 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 stocks, the stock shares owned by, by the public, for example. So this is what the stock options pool looks like uh, when, when your company is going public. It shrinks as an overall percentage, but again, this, this is what you're sharing with the broad uh, employee base, just to give you one, ex one example. So again, the, the key lessons to take away when creating stock options programs and pools are, at the very beginning, get the stock options arrangements for the founders right. Establish an overall game plan for equity incentives very, very early on that's consistent with 
typically U.S. law and U.S. equity incentives and stock options program. If you're planning to go into the United States or, or engage U.S. employees in the U.S. at some point, uh, typically you want to establish a stock option plan with the reserve. This stock option plan is a formal written, written document which is approved by the board of directors and shareholders, and you want to be uh, put a lot of effort into carefully designing this so that as you bring in more and more employees, again, you're aligning their, their personal interests uh, with, with the goals of the company. So let's talk now about company culture. This is a little bit more difficult topic to address because it's, it's a bit more uh, undefined, but this is also one very important method of, of attracting uh, employees uh, as, as you go along. This is one of the, the key reasons why Hewlett Packard, Apple, Google, other major Silicon Valley companies have been very, very successful because they spent a lot of time from the very beginning thinking, designing, creating, maintaining the right kind of company culture. So uh, when we think about company culture, we typ typically think about somewhat vague terms such as friendly, dynamic, relaxed, what does it feel like when you're inside the company, uh, to work there on a day-to-day -day basis, but it, it's actually much more, much more specific than that. It can include values such as effective uh, positive management, inspiring leadership, what is the brand, having a collective vision and purpose, the individual motivation given to um, individual employees, team dynamics, the degree of empowerment, uh, the degree of decision making which is pushed down to the low levels versus kept up at the high levels, how much hierarchy you have or don't have, how flat the organization is, how vertically uh, integrated it is, for example. And so very early on in the growth of rapid growth companies, this is something that founders will do is they'll sit down for an extended period of time, talk a lot about the kind of culture, the vision for the culture they want to create uh, as an important part of attracting and retaining employees, but also investors and customers. Um, Core values are a very important place to start in defining the company, the company culture. What does, what does the company stand for? Uh, this is where um, sometimes Europeans look at American companies' uh, core values such as do no evil as very naive American uh, sloganeering and hype. But we actually, we actually believe a lot of this. We, we try and live up to these ideals. And they are the start uh, in many companies of the discussion around what the company culture is, is about and why, why we are working together uh, as, a, as a team. What are we trying to accomplish? It goes, it's far beyond profit. What are we trying to accomplish? What, what is our vision for changing the world? So the leaders in company culture who've really been pioneering this started all with Hewlett Packard back in the 1950s and 60s uh, when Dave and Bill published a book called The HP Way which really has served as the Bible, as a handbook initially for how other CEOs and senior management teams have looked at the creation of company culture and how to do this and how HP did this over many, many years. Apple then took this the next step uh, into their particular market space their, uh, combined with their vision for the future, their technology domain. HP at that time when the, the core company culture was formed was much more of an enterprise company rather than consumer. Uh, Apple consumer, Google consumer, later enterprise. Google spent a lot of time thinking about the company culture very early on so that the first several hundred employees and even several thousand those people were individually reviewed. Their, their CVs, resumes were reviewed by Larry and Sergey to make sure that each individual had proper fit, personality fit, with the company culture that they were trying to establish. Uh, here in Europe, one of the leading examples of uh, thought leadership around company culture is Richard Branson, the Virgin Group in the UK. They spent a lot of time talking, implementing, creating company culture in each of the new companies they create uh, across, within the Virgin Group. And here in Croatia, I was very pleased when I visited Remots on Saturday to see that this is also something that they're thinking about as they're, at, they're about at 80 employees now, but when they get to 150, 200, uh, culture becomes a very important either uh, support system platform for expanding, for scaling up. If you don't do culture right, it actually becomes a hindrance and a block to scaling up and to bring in new company and new employees and to moving into new markets. So uh, some key takeaways for incentives. 
uh, for those, those companies who are thinking about becoming more than just a lifestyle business, more than just another European family-owned company. If you're thinking about going global, especially into the United States, hiring American employees, but also engaging with American investors and, uh, and customers, you need to think from the very beginning about stock options for founders and employees. The U.S. legal system is probably the best place uh, under which to establish stock options programs today, which also can apply to your employees here in Europe, although you do need to consult European Tax Council on this. It's easiest to issue options to European employees from U.S. stock options plans. These are very well understood by U.S. law firms. And then company culture is also extremely important to attract, retain new employees, but it's also a future enabler and platform for growth of the company. And you need to think about your company culture very, very early on. Ultimately, uh, incentivizing is really about empowering employees, empowering the company. I invite you to visit our website at Stanford, stanfordeuropreneurs.org. Uh, we look forward to seeing uh, more creation companies coming to Silicon Valley and speaking in the Stanford Engineering School. Thank you. Thank you.